friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop, starting on a new project. We have a mandolin here, and I'm not sure the maker on this mandolin. I don't know if the customer even knows. If I was guessing, I'd say, you know, something like a Regal, Washburn, you know, possibly even, possibly even Martin, but I doubt it because of the peg head doesn't look really like a Martin. It's got the kind of gears that go into the peg head and uh, it's got a cover for that. Basically we're gonna fix her up and make her playable again. This belongs to a fellow that uh, down in Texas his name is Michael Wilson and Michael came up here with some other folks and those other folks are significant in that I got Melissa out of that deal <laughs> because uh, Melissa and her husband have been customers for quite a long time. Actually, her husband has sent me quite a few instruments over the years and they were friends with Michael Wilson. Michael drove up here and while they were up here, they brought him over and he brought me these instruments. <laughs> and so while they were here, uh, the bit of trivia is I said, uh, I was telling them that I really needed office help and Melissa goes, and that's the name of that story. <laughs> so there you go. This one is significant in that uh, I better do a good job or maybe I'll end up losing Melissa over the deal. <laughs> it's about 15,000 slow right there. background noise but the neck just popped loose here I could see a crack there and I pulled just the tiniest bit on that crack to see if it would open up and it just opened all the way up there was very little holding it at all um, which it's good that it happened here I can glue it and put it back it's not the best deal here it's it just broke with the grain line apparently but it does match back up very well and we should be able to glue it and it'll probably be just as strong as it ever was, if not stronger. So we'll do that first thing. disappears you keep squeezing them back and together until you get all the glue out of there and then it'll actually hold and be stronger than it ever was and you can't even hardly tell it well we'll let that sit till after lunch and then it should be good regarding this mandolin there's a, a low spot right about here in the middle of the neck. You know, it's pretty high here and it's pretty high here. There's two ways I can see fixing this. These frets are really bad. We're gonna have to pull these frets regardless which way we go. And we're gonna have to replace them. I'm thinking what I'm gonna try is the easy thing first. Since I've gotta pull the frets anyway, I'm gonna pull all these frets, leave the fretboard attached like it is, just try to level this fretboard with a sanding board or something and get it level without the hump in the middle because that's basically what it amounts to. If I can do that, then I can just put the frets back in it and we'll be good to go. If that doesn't work, I may have to pull the fretboard, which it just adds time and money to the repair. And I don't think we want to do that if we can avoid it. Here we go, we'll pull the frets first thing. The method I'm going to use that I prefer to use on these really old dried out fretboards like this one is to soak it down with water. One argument would be that this swells up the wood and makes it harder to pull out. I don't buy into that argument too much. What I think it does is it softens the fibers on the ends and it really helps with the with minimizing the tear out. I find I get a lot less tear out on a really old fretboard like this if I just soak it down good first. One of the best ways to get the water under the fret is to rub it back and forth like this. 
I might even try the heat method too on top of the fret, but I, you know, I've heard a lot of people do that. I haven't tried that much. I think I tried it once. My results on it were just kind of like, yeah, so what? It didn't seem to make much difference. I think this will probably keep us from having much tear up though. Not so much. There's a pretty big tear up chunk there you can see already. You know, maybe I didn't wait long enough. I don't know. That's the problem with these really old fretboards. It just always chips out bad. You know, the more modern ones, they'll chip out, but not usually as bad as these. Sometimes they'll chip all the way across the whole fret. It can be really bad. Let's try, try another one. Got a little smaller puller here. This one's the one I used to use all the time. See if it'll do any better. I'll try to be a little more ginger. That one there I pulled out kind of fast. A eh, little bit of tear out this time, but much less than the first one. The first one I just pushed back in place, and I will go back through and CA glue it later, but not while it's wet like this. I can live with the damage on the second one. I'm just trying to do it much slower, keeping the head of the tool against the wood also keeps it from tearing out as much. Now yeah, that one tore out a little bit more again. As you've heard me say, it kind of is what it is. You just do what you got to do. Almost no tear out on that one. And almost no tear out on that one. Might be the trick is just to wet it down just before you pull it. That may seem to be helping or maybe it's had more time to get soft. Doesn't matter. Whatever the reason is, they're not tearing out as bad as they were. Yeah, that's not too bad either. I can live with that. These are the tiny frets. They've been filed a lot and the fretboard's so unlevel that there's no chance of leveling it through these frets the way it is right now. It needs more than, than those frets have to give. It may just be that I didn't wait long enough, that maybe I should have just waited a little longer because these, these are not tearing out as bad now. job not the best either nothing unexpected I guess I have CA glued the worst chip out spots and a few others at around got most of the worst out now I'm going to just try to level this with some sanding the biggest problem I think is you know coming across here and hitting this I'm worried about hitting this area I think a long sanding deal would probably almost hit it or very nearly hit it. So I'm just going to use this small block and some 220. Both ends are high, so I'm going to work on that first. It's improved already, but it's still got a ways to go. I've got a real flat sanding board that I use, and I'm going to uh, rub that on here and see what that looks like. I think you can see it's hitting here and hitting here. Hardly anything through the middle. And I knew that was the way it was going to be. Well, looking down at it, it's definitely improved. It's still not nowhere near right. You can see it's elongated a little bit and maybe even a little longer here. So it's getting there. By looking down it now, I could probably make that work, but I'm gonna go ahead and do some more. The sandpaper that's on the large board is much rougher. 
It's, I think, about 100 grit or something like that. This is 220. Maybe you can see down there and see how flat it is. I don't know if that shows up or not, but anyway, it's getting much, much, much better. Actually, I didn't quite expect it to be that good. Still needs some though, I think. And now you can see it's almost the length of it. It's just a little bit in this area. That area is right about in here where you're kind of, you can see it on the fretboard as well. I could probably live with that because we've really improved it a lot. And I can probably file the rest out through the frets themselves and feather the frets out to make it work. So let's just check it with the straight edge. Well, I wish it was better than that. It's not that great. It's still got, oh, it's probably still 15 thousandths off in the middle here. It's probably at least 15 thousandths low right there. I don't know if my little gauge will tell that very well or not, but it's definitely off. Yeah, it says right at 15 thousandths, as a matter of fact, in the lowest spot there. That's exactly what it is. So we're still quite low right here. And the thing is, it may actually overbow a little bit when I put the new frets in because the new fret tangs will be a little, probably a little bit larger and that will create a slight overbow. We may be okay with that. That happens, it for sure happens on a regular fret board when you got it laying loose. And I kind of think it's gonna happen on this. So I think I may just stop there and get the rest of it out in the frets themselves. And I'm pretty sure I can get the rest of it out in the frets themselves if I have to. I'm just going on intuition and experience. All the fret slots are full. So I just take an X-Acto blade, pull it backwards through the fret slot to clean them out. When you get up where you can hit the top of the instrument, you have to be much more careful. It will not be easy getting the frets in this part of the fretboard. It's just not a very strong instrument for one thing. We'll just have to find a way to support it through here. We'll have to find some way to support it all the way th straight through. Putting frets in is actually a violent process. It's not, it's nothing uh, easy. A lot of junk down in there, of course, from the sanding. Trying to make sure that the fret saw will go through it fairly easily to make sure they're opened up enough. Like this one here, and this may be because this is where it's all pinched together. It may be just tighter slot right here. And this one feels really tight also. And maybe I wanna leave them that way so that it will expand and, and open it up. Then you can feel these are getting a little bit looser again. And that, that one's actually loose. This one's not so loose. It's dangerous filing over the top of the instrument here like this. This one's really tight. You know, it's one of those deals where you can procrastinate all day or you can just get it done. So I guess we're gonna get it done. Well, I realize you don't have the best view of this. It's just the way it is. I'm going to tap this and I've got my piece of aluminum to drive it down in there a little bit better. I've got this supported with leather underneath this. My goodness, are you kidding me? That just broke off. You're talking about brittle. I'm sure that was already cracked because just tapping here shouldn't cause that to break. There's no reason, there's no pressure on that at all and it broke it right off. So I would say that was already cracked, but again, one more thing to fix. You know, evidence of the fact that that just broke off of there um, and that it wasn't anything I did is that, you know, keep in mind the peg head veneer is still perfectly intact. So this obviously had to be loose from the veneer and it already had to have a crack in it. Otherwise that wouldn't have just popped off without breaking the veneer. There's just no way. So it's broke off here, it's broke off here. This thing is in bad, bad shape. It is brittle, but it's still fixable. Believe it or not, I'm pretty sure we can fix it. And believe it or not, even as bad as that broke, I don't think you'll even be able to tell it when we're done. One more thing to point out about this, and this is, goes back to what I always talk about, perfect glue coverage. You can see there's glue here, there's glue there. There's not a bit of glue down the middle. You can see there's not a bit of glue down the middle here, and there's glue on both sides. And I think that's pretty obvious that you can see that. 
you just always want to make sure you've got perfect glue coverage. All of that adds to your strength. This I'm sure almost positive was hide glue. Hide glue is so terribly brittle. It just turns loose over time. And you know, everybody rants the praises of hide glue, but in my opinion, it's got way more negatives than it's got positives. You know, it was the best glue you could get back when ox carts were the best form of transportation. And guarantee you right now that uh, transportation has improved and so has glue technology. It doesn't look like there was any trauma in that area to make that glue turn loose. Now I'm wondering is this peg head veneer, is it still tight on the rest of this? And I don't have any way of knowing. But I'm going to have to clean this old glue off before I re-glue it, otherwise it won't stick very well. You have to be a bit of a contortionist sometimes to do these kinds of things. This notch right here won't let it be flat, so I have to hold it where this is off of the table and let this get flat down, otherwise it's going to break. I've got to keep that flat to the table and then scrape this. I don't give up easy and I still say this thing will be fine when we're done. Though, if too many more things go wrong, I may change my mind. I believe I actually suggested to the customer not to do this, and Melissa said that I did. That's what I told him, that if it were mine, I wouldn't fix this one. It apparently has sentimental value, and therefore it's worth doing. I believe I've got all the glue off. I think it's pretty much glue-free at this point. That seems like that's all real wood now. We'll set that out of the way carefully. And now we'll focus on this side and get the glue off of this. This is just rough sawn wood. It was not even sanded. You know, they made a lot of these things in factories and I'm sure that's the way they did it, you know. And the rough sawn in one way is, you know, helps the glue adhere a little bit. It isn't the way I would do it. This glue is not coming off as easy on this side. I can tell you for sure. It's a significant difference in the way the glue is coming off. It's coming off, but it's not nearly as easy. Oh my gosh, much harder. Well, that's pretty clean. I think I'm going to try the little bit of sandpaper on this too though. You know, it's hard to say whether that's all off of there or not, but I believe it is. I'm looking for any more little hairline cracks in this. I don't see any, but there could be some. This is some brittle stuff. Well, we've got to get it back together. I think we can do it. Once again, I'm gonna use the brush. I really feel I do better with that than anything else, especially on this kind of a repair, where everything's jagged. If it wasn't jagged, it might be different. And I got way more glue than I need, as I usually do. I'm pretty much guaranteeing you this will never come off again. Okay, I think, whoops, I didn't put it on here. Well, that's good though, because that'll give me more places to get rid of some of the excess glue. And actually, I don't have that much excess on here now. We'll put a little bit more on here. Okay, I think we got the bases covered. I think we're pretty good. We'll get some flat calls to clamp this in between now and we should be good to go. Well, my friends, all the catastrophes have been put back in order. We've got the peg head re-glued. You know, we've re-glued the neck back on after that broke off. I mean, everything is broke on this thing so far. So far, everything I've just touched or done the normal thing, it's just broken and fallen apart. Here we go again. We'll see if it holds up this time. It would not surprise me to have another catastrophe. We just have to handle them as we get to it. This first fret that I was driving in isn't driven home yet, so I've still got to finish driving it home. And this was just the first fret and we had catastrophe. That looks pretty good. Just trying to make sure it is completely all the way home. I think it is. Well, it didn't break that time. I've got the leather pad turn across the grain, across the fret this way, rather than running down the length of the fretboard. And that way I can put just specific pressure just under that particular fret. And I can do two at a time, so I'll move this down further after this fret. But right now I can still get one more fret out of the pad that I have here at the moment. 
pad placement, I should say. And I'm going to go ahead and start this one in. In this case, this mallet seems to drive them home just as well as, as the aluminum. So I'm just going to use the mallet for now. Again, it's got a plastic head on it. It actually seems to be working pretty well in, in this case. It works in other times too, but generally the aluminum is just a little bit stronger and makes them go down in a little better, but this seems to be fine on this one. So I'm loosening this up. I'm moving this leather pad down to the next two frets, and then I'm going to tighten it again. I also have leather under the heel right here. The instrument is really not touching anything, although the back of the instrument is probably laying on my table a little bit. This one's not laying flat. It's kind of teeter-tottering on that one a little bit, but I think I got it. I didn't put a radius in these first three frets. This fretboard is really flat, but I think I am going to go ahead and put just a tiny radius in these to help the ends stay down just a little bit better. Well friends, I've got quite a few frets in here now off camera. I just drove them in. I gotta be honest, it's, it's kind of like trying to drive a nail through an eggshell. This is a violent process. You cannot put these fret wires down in there gingerly. And yes, I know they make a fret press that could squeeze it, but on this neck, it would probably break the neck in half if you tried squeezing it anyway. I don't really know what else to do. I'm supporting it as good as I can support it right where I'm driving the fret specifically. That way it sends the shock straight down through, you know. And so far that's working. I haven't had any more catastrophes but I'm not going to film all this when I figure out how I'm going to put these frets in because these are over the body. I'll show you what I do there, but I have no idea what I'm going to do there yet, really. I, I truly don't. I just know I'm going to have to find some way to support it straight through because driving over this hollow body ain't going to work on this. There's a good block in this mandolin about this far. So I can drive these straight through down to the wood through that block, everything's solid. I put a cushion up here just in case it bounces. I've got a cushion at the back end also in case it bounces. But basically, I'm just driving straight through right here. So far, so good. Again, I get them started with this, but I, I, I still feel better with the aluminum. That's really good. It's working really better than I was expecting. On these up through here, because the wood is there, I'm going to cut them all off ahead of time. I know most people do that anyway, but for me that often wastes a lot of fret wire, so I've just used the same method, making sure I get them the right length. Uh-oh, here's a bug coming out of, uh, out of this thing. Actually, here's a couple of bugs. I'll be darned, this thing's got bugs. I don't know if you can see that or not, but I've never seen this type of bug before. It's a weird looking little bug. See if we can get the camera to zoom in on it. They're right there. And they are alive, crawling around. I truly have never seen one just like it. They're little tiny round looking bug and they've got a zigzag design across their exterior like shell or whatever. I have no idea what kind of bugs those are. But apparently they're coming out of that mandolin. They're not long for this world. Sorry. I've decided on a very radical approach to putting these frets in down here. I have never seen anyone else do it this way before, but I got to thinking there's just too much trauma is going to be inflicted if I try driving them. Pressing them I don't think is all that good of an option either, plus this is a very small hole. You can't get much through here to press, etc, etc. I don't have one of those specially made tools for fret pressing. How else could I do it? Well, like I said, driving it through, packing this full is an option, but that's probably not the best option. So I've decided I'm going to cut these slots to the exact size of the fret wire and push them in by hand. Basically, it works. I've already tried it on some scrap wood. I cut these through here freehand, and you can see they're pretty darn straight for just freehand. And I'm going to cut these freehand as well. The fact that these slots are here, I think the freehand will work even better here because it should be able to follow the slot that is there. This bit that I have in here is 39 thousandths. I measured the tang on this at 36 thousandths and I've already pressed it into here and it does press in by hand but you got to push and my point is that I can press it in by hand and then I can CA glue it in place. That won't cause any trauma. 
Now, the CA glue, you gotta be careful because it can run everywhere and cause even more trauma. That being said, I think I can handle that and I'll take every precaution I can there too by taping it off, etc. So I think that's the best option in this case because we've already proven how fragile this thing is. That's what we're gonna do. Now, had I thought of the option ahead of time, obviously it would have been better had I not put these frets in. Hindsight's 2020. So I think I can still do it this way. It's just a little more complicated. Wish me luck is all I can say. So here we go. Once again, the lighting's probably not the best for you. It works for me. I can see what I'm doing and that's what counts. I don't think that one's going to be deep enough because it's sitting on top of these frets, but I'm gonna double check it. Ah, perfect, <laughs> perfect. It's, and it's even stuck in there too. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and pull it back out, but that's just like perfect. You couldn't get it any better, I don't think. That is perfect. So here we go, we're gonna cut the rest of them. Now you notice I pulled it that way that time. That's easier for me to see. Plus, the old analogy, it's easier to pull a chain than it is to push a chain. That went easy and perfect and the slots are perfectly straight. So I'm no problem at all. I'm pretty sure that was the best decision there. That seriously was the best idea I've had in a while on something like this. You might want to try that yourself when you have a situation where it's just tedious like that. I'm sure I can glue these frets in. They don't just fall in, you gotta kinda press them in. In fact, even they might take a little extra pressing, but they go in. That's just about perfect. If anything, it's still just a little bit out right here. That looks good. if that last little piece is long enough. Not quite, just a fraction of a hair too short. <laughs> so that's what it looks like with all the frets in that section. They have not been glued yet. I'll show you how I'm going to glue them. You can see I have the fretboard taped off. I put tape under here also in case it drips down in so it won't get inside the, the mandolin. In addition to putting the tape on there, I took this little burnishing tool and I just kind of burnished the edge of the tape lightly just to make sure it's really stuck down well here so it doesn't run underneath it because I'm sure this CA glue could easily run in this situation. had a 30 seconds or so to set up and I'm going to spritz it with this accelerator just to make sure it's drying. It looks good. Everything looks level to me. I don't see a problem. So I'll strip the tape off and then we'll start working on Well, actually I'm going to leave the tape on because I've got to level these ends and stuff and that'll just keep me be a good way to help keep from scratching anything. Now these frets are all sticking out proud of the edge. So I've taped this off and I'm just going to go along this way and try to knock those frets down. It's really hard to not scratch the edge here. We may have to come back and touch that up. We just do the best we can. You can 
see the process there and it's a bit tedious and I'll just keep doing that till I get satisfied. For leveling the frets here, I'm taking my regular leveling file and I'm just carefully as I can just going along the edges. You just have to keep doing it till you're satisfied with it and you blend them down through the other frets too. It's looking pretty good. We're getting close. start rounding them off. It's just a tedious process and just you got to take your time with it. We may be good enough for that for now on that side and basically I just have to do the whole thing again on the other side. Well believe it or not this is the crack where it broke on me and it went all the way up through here, right there if you can see it. And you can see where there's a little bit of glue squeeze out that I haven't cleaned up yet. So there and on the other side, I don't see where it went, but now it's opened up at this back crack, which was already there, but somebody else had fixed it. And you can see maybe how it's opening up there, except now that I've got it glued to the peg head, it can't come all the rest of the way off. So now I've got to get glue in this mess Gee whiz, it just doesn't quit with this thing. What a disaster. I hope it's solid when I'm done. I think it will be. I've got this uh, glue injected into the cracks and I'm cleaning up my part. You can see though that this ain't the first rodeo on this thing breaking up here. It's been glued several times. There's old, old glue, you know, piled up around in different places everywhere. You know, I had nothing to do with any of that. We're gonna clean all that up too eventually, chip it off with chisels and knives and things. But, uh, but for right now, I just wanna get the peg head stabilized again. And I think it is. I can see the glue squeezing out everywhere where I pressing it with my hands. So I'm sure that I've got it down in there good. Now I just get some clamps put on it again and we'll let it set again. The mandolin has a very, very fine hairline crack right down the middle, right at that seam. I don't think I can get wood glue in there. It's that tight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tape off within just a fraction of a hair from the crack on both sides where I can just barely, barely see the crack on both sides. And I'm going to use CA glue. I would prefer to use wood glue, but I just don't think I can really guarantee to get it in there. I'm gonna use this little burnisher again and burnish the tape down just a little bit right along that crack. And I'm going to do the same thing here, burnish it again. That way you're at least fairly assured you're not gonna get glue all over the whole top. Not 100% sure of anything because anything can happen with the CA glue. You can feel it moving. Now I know this side is just a little proud of that side. Hold a little bit of pressure on this just to try to even it up. And again, it's even hard to tell how much pressure to hold. I'll let it sit for, oh, 10, 15 seconds like this. And then I'll spritz it with the accelerator. It did seem to penetrate down in there. That's about as good as it gets. Taking my fingernail and kind of scratching it off, it's still a little bit soft at the moment. And honestly, I don't think you can hardly tell that anything was done there now. A little bit of tape left on there, apparently. But feels solid there now. I don't, I don't see it moving. I think that fixed that problem. That's the only way to do it. I'm probably going to do the same type of technique, CA glue around this. This is the old nitrite type pick guard. It's very, very super, super thin. I mean, like the whole pick guard's probably not more than 20 thousandths thick, if that. You can't take that off and put it back on. That's impossible. You'd never find anything that would match it. The whole pick guard is there. It's just loose on this end. 
I'm a little bit afraid to even try heat on it. Heat would be a good idea, but this kind of material is super flammable. I mean like you just hardly, you touch a match to it and it'll just go up in a flame. Very, very flammable. So I don't think heat is a great idea in this case. I'm just going to use the CA glue and press around on it and try to get it to hold. I don't hardly know anything else to try. I mean, almost anything else you put in there could work glue-wise, but I think the CA glue is almost guaranteed to work compared to anything else. The difference is the CA glue can run everywhere and just create a mess. So you have gotta be super careful with the CA glue. I think I'll start over here because this side looks like it might be easier to, to do. It's not up in the air quite as much. I wanna see before I do it if I can use this to press down on it and, and keep it down. And I think I can, this is pretty smooth. Although I'm gonna make sure that that's even smoother. I'm gonna take some 600 to that and make sure it's really smooth. I actually took some 1200 to the back of that and got it really slick. Oh, this is dangerous. That worked pretty well. Now if we can just keep it down. I would rather not use the accelerator on this because I'm afraid what the chemical could do to the plastic. I'm a little bit leery about that with the CA glue itself. It's not really holding well. I'm afraid it's not sticking. The one advantage CA glue has over other glues is that it sticks to itself as good as it sticks to anything else or better. So if it doesn't work on your first application, you have a second application attempt that should work. Because generally, once it sets up, even though it didn't stick the two surfaces together, it'll stick to both surfaces, and then you can try it again and stick it to itself, and it usually works great the second application if it doesn't work on the first one. So that's one advantage of the CA glue. I would say it didn't really do what I was hoping, so it doesn't look like it's stuck, though it's possible it just hasn't completely dried yet. I can still see it moving now that I say that. I can still see a tiny bit moving in there, so maybe it just hasn't dried yet. Yeah, it's just not sticking. It'd be nice if it would just stay down. The moisture from your breath can help CA glue cure a little bit too, but in this case, it doesn't seem to be helping all that much. It's kind of staying down a little bit now, but I don't think it's really sticking. I'm gonna put another application of it in there. Wow, it sure is fighting me. Like I said, I'd really rather not use accelerator on this, but it doesn't seem to be drying. Well, this little weapon of mass destruction has fought me every step of the way on every little thing, I will say that. not insurmountable, but it's definitely had its share. I'm debating strongly whether I want to go ahead and use the CA glue. I did it over here and it worked fine. It worked great, I think. It just didn't stick for the longest time though. And I'm debating over here whether I want to try my canopy glue on this one. Off camera, I've opened this up as much as I can, got in there with my little X-Acto knife and kind of scraped the underside of this to get the glue off of it as much as I can. And, you know, I've scraped it quite a bit. And I've also turned it up where gravity would let that junk fall out of there. And I've blown in there to blow the dirt and junk out of there. It lays pretty flat. I think if I can get a clamp on there with this glue, I think I might be better off. I could be wrong. You know, I could be making a mistake. I haven't tried this canopy glue on this kind of plastic that I can recall. I'm gonna give it a shot. I think this might be the way to go. Worst case scenario is I have to spend some time digging the glue out of there, but I think it'll be fine. I'm going to use a little wedge to hold this up temporarily so that I don't have to keep lifting it up and down. Lifting it up and down could cause it to break or something. And I'm just going to squeeze this glue around, let gravity feed it down in there, and I will take a paintbrush and paint it under there. That's the one advantage of the CA glue is you don't have to worry about it. It'll suck itself back in there, capillary action. This stuff, not so much. I'll move this around, try to get this way back under there. Pretty sure this is gonna get back under there far enough too. Another advantage of this is you don't have to worry about this hurting your finish or anything. It's water soluble and you can clean it up 
pretty easily. In fact, I've got a little water on my cloth here and I'll just wipe it off. It's gonna squeeze out again when I clamp this. I like to squeeze it two or three times, you know, uh, that helps work the glue back under there further. I think this is gonna work. I've got a little pad of leather here, not so much because I need the pad, but mostly so that it'll help press on this area a little bit more. Just gives a little thickness there that I think will put an extra amount of pressure on this. These little plastic clamps are kind of handy on something like this. I think they are anyway. We're going to find out here. Actually, it's not going to work as well as I wanted. I did it dry off camera and it seemed to work, but I can tell it's not really pressing down this edge as much as I want. And so I guess I'm just going to get regular small C clamps and use those. I put the little C clamp on here and I think you can see it's really squeezing out the glue very well. I think it's the right way to go in this case. I'm going to clean up that squeeze out of course. It's still not clamping as well as I want over here on this edge. So I'm going to add some more clamping force here. You got to be very careful now because this mandolin is brittle and I don't want to break it. I'm just putting just enough pressure to hold it down. Just enough to get snug, not really push hard. And I can see some more squeeze out there, which I'm going to just use a damp paintbrush and clean up at this point because I can't get under the leather very well. At least I'll get rid of the lumps that way. And I think that's in good shape. I am 99% sure that glue will hold it just fine. And I can let that set now. I don't have to deal with it. Off camera, I've cleaned out the inside of this and got these tuners sitting down in there good and flat. You can see they barely poke through, really. I think it's solid, I don't know. I've also taken toothpicks and glue and filled all the old holes that would screw this cover plate on. All of the holes are wallered out. And a lot of people say, well, you know, you could use something bigger than toothpicks, and you could, but I truly actually like using the toothpicks for these things because even if it takes multiple toothpicks, and the reason is that the toothpicks will expand out into the weird shapes. Like often they're maybe they're oblong holes. They're not round. They're not just overly big. They're like in a line or maybe they're triangular shaped or something like that. And you can just keep jamming little toothpicks down in there and fill up that whole space with glue and everything. So I actually think the toothpicks is about the best way to go in. That's just my opinion. I mean, and it would depend on, you know, certain circumstances, obviously, if it was a gigantic hole, well, then you might try something else. But anyway, that works great for me. I'm going to go ahead and start putting the screws back in. I've already taken my awl and punched a hole where the down through the screws, you know, centering it. I did the center one first, and now I'm going to do these two down here. I'll do this one first. This one here was really wallered out huge. It was a really big hole. And so I'll put this one in next. It took about five toothpicks to fill the hole with glue, but we should be good now. There were only three screws that I could find with this that came with it. So I'm going to need two more screws. Fortunately, I have a lot of these old screws and I think I'll have something that will match pretty close. They're tightening up really nice because I jammed the toothpicks in there really tightly. Look through the little screw bag there and I, I found two that match pretty closely. And again, I'm just taking the awl, making a hole pretty much in the center of the toothpicks. This was a lot easier before arthritis. It's really hard to get your fingers to hold things now. That's weird. That one there tightened up to a point and then it just like it stopped. That's the first one that did that. Not exactly sure why it did that. But I mean like it just stopped. It was like it hit something hard. Wow, it's just stopping. I have to figure that one out. I have no idea why that's doing that. That's weird. Yeah, this one's going all the way down in, no problem. I have no idea what this is doing here, but it's like it's hitting something super hard and just stopping. Maybe the screw itself, that's what it is. This screw, the body of this screw is just a hair bigger than that hole and it's hitting in that hole and stopping. 
So I'll have to find something else that'll work. I think this one will do it. Hopefully it didn't mess up the hole. Yeah, that's the difference. I was wondering what happened there. That How could that just stop? But it did. That's good and tight. Yeah, that's fine. So I've got those five screws very tight now. They're, they all tightened up really well, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. Now, these tuning keys are still loose in there because of the design of the way this works. Now, I should have turned them all beforehand. I didn't try them. I'm assuming they're all working. Uh-oh, here's one that, wouldn't you know, wouldn't you know, I didn't try them. I should have tried them. This one here seems really tight. That may be okay. I may have to just squirt a little oil in through the side there. I'm gonna have to take it back apart. I should have thought of that. You know, sometimes you just get ahead of yourself. I didn't think to actually test them. I just assumed they would be okay. And wouldn't you know, because I put the cover on there, they're not okay. Oh, you'd think I'd learn. But I am not perfect. There's no question about that. So we'll take it back apart, get those tuners turning better. It's not a catastrophe, it's only five little screws. Mostly it's probably just lack of oil. So many people are so afraid to oil these things, but the truth is that does not make them slip. I promise you, I guarantee you, that has nothing to do with them slipping. The only time they slip, and actually I never hardly ever see any of them slip to be perfectly honest with you, what people call slipping is generally backlash. And if you tune down to a note, you'll get backlash. Your string will pull the backlash out, which makes it feel like it's slipping. But it's not technically slipping. The design of these things, because of the worm gear, they can't hardly slip. If they could slip, you'd see the tuning key actually reversing, and they don't do that. It's physically almost impossible for them to slip. <laughs> And I, I know that's the common term that everybody uses. I'm not saying they can't loosen up and that they can't have more backlash as they get older and wear, but they don't actually technically slip, even though that's the term everybody uses. You know, if you just think about it from a common sense standpoint, this thing has to spin for it to slip, right? When that spins, it's pushing against that worm gear that way. It can't spin. It can't spin. And it doesn't have enough force to push hard enough to make that worm gear turn. There's just no way. The worm gear turns the spur gear and that's how it works. But you can't get that spur gear to turn that worm gear. I mean, if you put a vice grips on this, I doubt seriously you could get that to turn that worm gear. So from a common sense standpoint, I'm just trying to point out the practical side of these things so that you'll understand it's not really the tuner that itself is slipping. It's some other problem. If you're experiencing a problem, it's something other than actually slipping. Unless maybe you're, I mean like maybe your screws are loose. Sure, something like that could cause a problem, no question. But all things being equal, they don't technically slip meaning they don't auto-rotate backwards or anything. They just can't do it. It's impossible. Well, these, I have to tell you, are pretty tight. They're pretty darn tight, actually. These won't have much backlash in them, I can tell you, because they are tight. But they all have backlash. Hmm, man, they're really tight. Okay. You know, I hate to loosen this screw up, but that's about the only thing you can do sometimes to get them to turn better. Makes a lot of difference sometimes. That one's still tight, even though I loosened it a little bit. I'm just loosening them just a little bit, because they're really tight. Man, they're tight. Gee whiz. Ridiculously tight, actually. It turns one way pretty good, but when you try to back it up, it doesn't want to turn, and that's generally a sign of some kind of wear in the gears. Ah, boy, it doesn't want to turn at all that direction. That's not good. I'm gonna loosen it up quite a bit more and see if that makes a difference. Yeah, it did. Now it's turning, but it's still not great. Wow, I don't know. Well, I got it oiled as much as you could possibly want to oil one, so I, don't, I know it's not the oil. It turns fine that direction, no problem, but when you start backing it up, it just 
catches big time. I mean, it's like really hard to turn backwards. The center of that gear looks really worn, even compared to these other gears. Bomber, I'm gonna have to give this some thought, see what the problem is. I've taken this gear apart because I know there's something wrong. I don't know what it is exactly. It kinda looks like the worm is wore a little bit more in the middle than on the other ones. And I would say that's because this one turns so hard and over the years people have just wore it out. Oh, looky here, as I'm talking to you there, I found a piece of metal that's wore off of something. I'm not exactly sure. It probably won't show up, but right on the end of my finger there, what looks like brass. And I would say that that came off of this somewhere, probably sheared off because it's turning so hard. The other thing that I noticed was how hard it was to get this out of this. Now you can probably see that hole is, you know, it's not perfectly square. It's kind of a rectangular with a round end. And that's the way this is made. It's round, but it's got a rectangle filed across the sides. It's meant to go together. Typically they are not that hard to go together. This one is crazy hard. I had to pull it apart with pliers and all the strength I had to pull it apart. So I'm thinking that might be some of the problem because typically they're not that tight. I'm not saying other brands aren't that tight. I typically don't see them that tight. So what I'm gonna do is file across this flat, especially the side that looks really rough. The one of the flat sides looks really rough and I've got a real smooth file here that I can maybe knock that roughness down. Yeah, that did a pretty nice job. The other side's pretty smooth. Go back to that rough side again. Maybe that might be part of the problem. You know, maybe it's got the gear so pinched. I don't know if that's gonna make it go together better or not. I also looked really close to see if this gear had been changed. And from what I can tell, it looks original. I don't see any subtle difference in it. It looks really identical to the others. It's got the same slant. I believe it's the same number of keys. Everything looks the same about it, so I don't think it's been changed. The peg itself doesn't look like it's been changed either. It's really tight. Like I jammed it on there and I can't, well, there I got it apart, but it ain't easy to get it apart. Got a little tiny square file and I'm gonna go through the hole on the flat part of that hole and try to clean it up too. Not trying to remove very much, just trying to see if there's any burrs or anything that would make it sit extra tight. There, it, it went on a lot easier that time and it came off a lot easier that time. Still not easy, but it's easier. Definitely a lot easier because I, I literally had to pull it apart with pliers the last time and it wasn't easy to get it apart. I see a burr here. My thought is these burrs might be tipping the gear one way or the other, making it hard to turn. It's kind of more like a wish than anything. I hope that's the problem because I can't really see anything else other than, like I said, this gear looks like it's pretty much wore because of it. And I don't think I have a way to replace that gear too easily, it, especially with this button, this kind of button and everything. This is this old button. These buttons, you probably won't see it on camera. I doubt you'll see it, but they've got an ivoroid little kind of a patterning to them. Try to get it up close. Maybe the camera will focus and you can see that little patterning. And so, you know, it would be very hard to replace that and replace that gear. So anything that we can do to avoid that would be wonderful. Here's another one of those bugs that came out of this thing. Let's see if you can see the bug up close. It's a weird little bug. It's got a little weird pattern on it. I don't know what kind of bugs those are, but this thing is loaded with those things. I'm pretty sure those are not just something in the shop because I've never seen them before until I got this instrument out. Crazy. This may be really hard to get back together because it was really hard to get apart. Nope, went right back together easy. Well, we might have improved it because it definitely went back together easy. It was not easy getting it apart. Let's just see where we're at now. 
snugging it up pretty snug. Okay, it still turns easy the one way, which it did. Let's just see if we get lucky. Will it turn backwards now? Well, it's certainly easier. It's got one little spot where it gets a little tight, but it's nothing like it was. I mean, that's way better. So there you go, there's a lesson for you. Just the post itself had enough burrs on the end of that post to make that gear set off to the side, apparently. You can see there, I'm turning it and I'm turning it the other way, no problem. Where before, it was all I could do to turn it the other way. So, there you go. We got lucky. This one's a little tight too. All of them are a little tight. I'm about halfway tempted to do to all of them because they're all a little bit grungy. screws in here. I'm just keeping them in the same relative hole because I've already put them in there and I, you know, I'd, I'd like for them to find their same spot because they're not all identical screws. This old mandolin, it really pretty much needs everything. That's for sure. You can pretty much tell that. But I bet you we're going to have a playable instrument when we're done. At least I think we will. Got that oil all over everything now. And, and, and three in one oil, by the way, is not harmful to the wood or anything. As a matter of fact, some of the companies like Martin, I believe, recommends even putting three-in-one oil on your bare wood, so it's not a big deal. Okay, I think we're moving along. Next thing is we're going to need to finish this fret job. I, I kind of stalled on that because I was gluing the pick guard back. The pick guard, I believe, is solid now. I don't think there's any problems with it anymore, and now I can get back to the fret job. I've taken uh, the wood filler. I use this Timbermate and it's just in white and people ask me a lot often, why don't you get the different colors? You could do that and it wouldn't be any problem and it would work fine. I don't have any problem just using the one color and dyeing it. In fact, I think I get a better match often that way anyway. So to me, it's easier just to keep one color in stock and I just use it and dye it to match. My point of showing you this is um, like these frets extend all the way through the fretboard and I'm just filling the very ends of the frets where the, the slot is just a hair deeper than the fret is and therefore you know you have little holes and little imperfections right on the edge and so I'm just cleaning all that up and filling all that. Once it's dyed to match it will uh, really make it look nice and, and finished, you know. And it even makes it slicker feeling. You can just feel the difference. There's a little tiny tear out there under the fretboard. It's just tiny, but we'll fix that too. We're gonna let this set overnight because uh, it's late in the day. And then we'll come back. It'll be good and hard and dry in the morning. A little bit right here on this end too, but not much. There's a gouge here on the side. I'm not sure what caused that gouge, but we'll just go ahead and fill the gouge. I think it'll be better. We'll go with that for now. I think I got everything filled. That'll just make it look that much nicer. This is 600 grit sandpaper, so it's really not sanding much off of this. It's just knocking off any rough spots. 
you know, because this neck broke all the way around here, so I just want to make sure it's perfectly smooth that you don't feel that. You cannot feel it. It's not there. That's all I'm doing with the sandpaper. I'm not trying to sand it down to bare wood or anything. And the sandpaper also, right around the edges, ends of those frets, uh, the 600, it makes it soft and you don't hardly feel it at all now. So we're getting in pretty good shape here. Now we're gonna get out the dye and touch up the little spots and we'll probably do a, a kind of a white dye wash over this whole thing to just kind of make it blend back together. I'm gonna to probably have to ask Melissa or my wife or somebody what color this is because it could be anything from a burgundy mahogany color to a black to a brown. I truly don't know what color it is. So we'll just, you know, find out something that matches and we'll wash it over with that. No one's in the shop to ask on the colors right now, but I can tell that this here is a dark brown. So I'm not too worried about matching the fretboard. I've got some dark brown leather dye and we're just going to more or less touch up the, the white spots. Pretty sure the dark brown will work with that. And if I have to, I'll wash over the whole fretboard with that. But I'm just right now, I'm gonna just touch the, the white spots themselves to dye the spots. And then if I need to, I'll wash over the whole fretboard. And it looks like I'm gonna need to do that. So I'll probably do that here in a minute. I don't really wanna get it on the pearl, but it will wash off of the pearl. So it's not that big a deal, if, even if I do get it on there. You really can't see where I've put the timber mate now. I mean, it really does fill it in nice and you can't even tell it. You know, you could use a filler that was the right color already, but I don't think it's necessary. I'm gonna go ahead and use the same stuff on the edge of the fretboard too. And then we may do something else on the neck. I filled underneath each fret. All I do is just wet the cap. There's really nothing in the cap, it's just wet. And that's what I use. It flows kind of like the CA glue does and it'll just run everywhere if you use very much. So to me, that's the best way to apply it. That's another little tip for you there is just wet the cap. There's really nothing in the cap as you can see, it's just wet. And so you can put your brush in there and get a very small amount on your brush and then touch up these things. I think I'm gonna go ahead and just dye the whole top of this with the dark brown to make it all one uniform color. So in this case, I'll pour just a little bit in the cap because it's gonna take some to do that. And I'll get a little bit bigger brush so that it doesn't take me forever to do it. Now the problem is when you get to this pearl, you're gonna get it on the pearl and there's really nothing you can do about it. The only thing you can do is if you wipe it pretty quickly, most of it will come off the pearl. It'll still be a little bit yellow, but not too bad. And the frets themselves are also tarnished from the, the dye, but it comes off the frets mostly. It looks nice when you're done. Just about got the fretboard covered. It looks pretty nice. I wiped off the pearl as much as I can. You just lightly dampen the, the cloth and wipe the pearl again. It'll even get a little bit whiter without messing up the fretboard too much. Now I'm going to uh, experiment. This stuff here works pretty good. I hope it doesn't get real dark in this crack, but I wanted to try to touch up the crack here. I'll try a little bit, wipe it off. And typically when you wipe it right back off, it won't be very dark. It'll disguise a lot of scars that way. I think it looks better. There's a little nick here and there. Just gonna touch up the little spots. This spot here, which I would assume is from somebody's finger hand or something the way they were playing, and I don't know why exactly, why there would be a scar there, but we'll see if we can't make some of that disappear too. And you th might think, well, this is way too dark. And I would kind of agree with you, except that don't think it's gonna stick because there's a finish under this and I just think it'll darken it up some. See, I think it did. I think it made it look a lot more to the original than it looked without it. Again, you just apply it a time or two there. I think that looks better. It doesn't stand out quite as much. It was real bright looking before. Now it's a little duller and yet it's in the same tone, or at least it appears to be to me. Again, I'm gonna let it sit there for just a couple minutes or just a you know a couple seconds really and then kind of blot it off of there and keep blotting until I get it about the color 
that I want. That looks better to me by quite a bit. I think that looks a lot better. I know how these dyes work, so it won't hurt me to use the, the dark brown on this. It may not be the right color, but since there's nobody here to ask, it won't hurt to put it on there because I can always go darker. The thing about these dyes is it's hard to go lighter, but it's not hard to go darker. And even the lighter you can do pretty well with uh, alcohol. It will kind of lighten it up. But actually this is, for whatever reason, seems to be blending pretty well. It's not perfect though. I can tell it's not a perfect match. It should be darker, it looks like. Just gonna blot it rather than wipe it because the blotting doesn't pull it off as much. That looks real good to me. Looks, almost looks like it matches. I could be wrong, but it looks pretty good to me. Okay, there's, just as an example, there's the brake line right through here where it broke. Now on this side, I think you can still see it. But after we touch it up, I don't think you can really see it much. I mean, it's pretty much gone. You can see it, but you kind of got to know what you're looking for. Okay, well, I think that looks good enough to me. I don't really think it needs to be much better than that. I think that's fine. Good enough. We'll move on. I have this piece of rosewood that I'm going to try to make the bridge out of for this mandolin. These types of bridges were typically just one piece. I haven't looked online or anything to see what this bridge might have looked like. They're pretty much, most of them are all pretty similar. So I'm just going to cut this off the length and then I'll shape it to what shape I believe it should be. I can tell by looking down the fretboard that this is going to be way high even at that. We can start with that and work on the details. We're going to need to curl off the end here. Typically the end had some kind of a curl like this. This might be a little bit small of a radius. This radius might be about right. Something like that. And I think I'm just going to eyeball it. So for the camera's angle there, you know, I'm just kind of leaving about, oh, roughly an eighth of an inch, kind of centering it there. You can go back further or whatever. Just kind of getting a general idea and then just draw that on there like so. It doesn't look too bad and I'll probably do the same thing on this side. It looks fairly even. I can always even it up on my spindle sander. But basically we'll just cut a little curl out of the ends there and uh, then we'll bevel off the top back toward the center on both sides. That's kind of the way those were typically made. I've whittled that piece of rosewood down so that it's approximately the footprint of what used to be there. Now, the one thing about this is, and part of this is just wear, but it was made this way. There, there is a slant here this direction. Now. I'm assuming the bridge was in the right place, but I don't know that for sure. I mean, perhaps it needs to be there. You know, I don't know. I haven't measured it, so let's try to measure it and see if we're uh, using millimeters and we measure to the 12th fret. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So if we measure, that would be 16.4 centimeters. According to that, that would be pretty close. It needs to be back, I would say, about there, actually. That's just a guess at this point. Maybe not quite that far, but about there. That would be about right. You know, I think we're going to end up with a nasty scar here in the front. But in either case, it's still on the slope facing this way. So, I have a flat bottom on this, and that's not going to work very well. I'm going to need to tip this back, I'm going to have to angle the bottom off so that this will sit up flat because if you leave it leaning forward, it's just going to fall over forward. So I'm going to have to monkey with that a little bit. In order to minimize this ugly scar in the front, I had already cut a longer bevel on one side of this than the other and I had intended that longer bevel to go on the back side. But because I'm pretty sure this bridge is going to need to be back further. I'm now putting that longer bevel on the front side. That moves the bridge back that way, on the top at least. 
and I also slanted it back that way. So now everything's moved back that way quite a bit. It's still not as far back as it needs, but I think we're going to get rid of most of the scar in the front this way. You know, so 16.4 roughly. Yeah, actually we're right on the money right there. So we could probably get by with it just barely showing any scar in the front by doing it that way. It's going to be close either way. All right, well, we're just about ready to start cutting the slots and things and start stringing this up. Well, I'm positive this nut's going to be high too, so I'll probably file some of this off before I start getting serious. I could have cut this down more, but, you know, it is what it is, as I say. I have my little trusty plastic gauge that I've been using for years to mark these off. That should get me in the ballpark. Again, I'm just using my standard little fret saw. That's all this is, just a Stuart McDonald fret saw made in Germany. It says, I forget the thickness here, but roughly in the 20 thousandths range. Again, I always use the uh, fret saw just to uh, get me started. You know, you notice I'm turning it. I'm using it like a file more than I'm using it like a saw. It doesn't build up like a, a, a file will. So I just get myself close with this and then I'll use the actual nut files for the rest of it. Each one you swing it a little bit less because you need a little narrower slot. So I'm not swinging this one all the way down, just most of the way. And then these we don't swing at all, we just cut them toward the post they go to. Might swing it just a little bit, just so that it doesn't catch. And these, of course, we don't swing at all. Okay, that'll at least get me in the ballpark. Those are still going to be uh, way high. We're in the ballpark anyway. On this one, I'm just marking where the center line is, looking down the mandolin to see if that looks pretty good. I think it's going to be fine. And now I will just center this up on there and cut the slots. And the only one I want to remove is that center mark because I know I don't want to cut that. That should get me going. And I'm going to use this nut file for this. So I have those all marked out now and we should be able to at least start putting some strings on this thing and see if it'll hold together or if we're going to have to do more work. Ordinarily on the F-style mandolins, I recommend using standard gauge strings or even heavy, slightly heavy. These are as light as I could find. These are 34s down to, I believe, 10s, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 34s to 10s. So these are much lighter, but that's what this mandolin needs. And it's not just because this thing is falling apart. <laughs> It's because this style mandolin with this flat top just can't support the weight that an arch top can support. This is where it pays off to have fixed those tuning keys. And before we go much further, I just wanted to get a gauge of how high we're talking about here. We're talking pretty high on both ends. I'm going to take this end down first to get it a little lower because it's way high, I can tell. Got my thickness gauge out here and uh, my bevel gauge if you will and it's it's right at the top of it it's just about right i'm going to call it 150 thousandths i would really like this to only be about 50 thousandths realistically i don't think we're going to get there on this mandolin i don't think it's possible in order for that to happen we'd really have to cut this way down so i'm just going to cut it way down but not as far down as it would have to go to make that happen. I'm just gonna cut it down as low as I think it looks reasonably good and we're gonna probably just have to go with that or uh, adjust it slightly after that. But I'm gonna cut quite a bit of this off and we'll see what happens. I skipped ahead quite a bit. Um, basically, I just got the strings on this thing and got it tuned up. You can see about where this needs to be for the intonation. It's about where I measured it. It needs to go way back. You know, there's gonna be a scar in front of it. How they played it all that time, I mean, it couldn't even have noted close. I mean, if you notice, that's a whole fret off, at least when you get up into these shorter frets. That's a whole fret off. So it couldn't have played right. It, it's uh, pretty close now. It's not absolutely perfect, but it's pretty close. 
that's right on the money on the G. Now I got to be honest on the E, it's a little harder to tell because I think it's hitting some of these low uh, frets up in here, but you can't really do much about that either. I don't know, it's hard to tell. But anyway, uh, it's about as good as it's going to get set up. The action's not too terribly bad. You know, I would like to see it down at 50, but it's a little higher than that. Um, but not a lot higher. The action in this area is right about 70. So 20 thousandths higher than what I would like to see it. But 20 thousandths, and that sounds like a ton. It seriously isn't. It's like f the thickness of about four sheets of uh, notebook paper. So, I mean, if you put four sheets together, that's how, my, how much too high it is. That's not that high. And considering the option, the only way to fix that at this point would either be to cut this down some more, which would really kill the angle. There's hardly any angle anyway, or do a neck reset. So to me, the trade-off is just play it a little bit high. That's all. It's got a decent sound. This thing here is cutting me the whole time I'm playing. It's got a little crack in it and it's really sharp right there. And so that's got to be fixed. Well, that's really tight too. Didn't seem that tight going on, but it's really tight coming off. There it is. Okay, so maybe you can see that up a little closer there, what the corner is. That actually is very sharp. So what I'm going to do is bend it to make it go away. Got the plastic pliers here. And I'm just gonna bend the corner back in under there. I think it'll go. That's most of it. I'm trying to think of what else I could do. I could probably solder it, but I don't know that I could get the solder to stick for sure. I'm gonna try to bend it a little bit more underneath there. That's just about perfect there. And now I think on this side, I'm gonna take a wire brush to it, I'll go across that crack and clean it up and see if we can't solder that. It might solder on the inside possibly. Well, I tried to wire brush the crack on the inside and I can't really get into it very well. So I'm gonna try just some sandpaper with a little popsicle stick here and see if I can't get in there and sand it a little bit. Mostly sand it right across the crack. Yeah, that's working, I think. Yeah, that seems to be kind of working. It's a little difficult though, even that is hard to get in there. Well. That's about as good as I'll get it. I think if I could get solder across all three of those corners there, all three places, I think I could take a file to it then and knock off that extra sharpness on the outside. I think it'll be okay. Let's give it a shot. I've got the little soldering iron here and we'll see if we can get it to uh, work with this uh, metal. I kind of think it'll work, but I don't know for sure. I've got it heated up pretty hot. There it's starting to go, it's starting to flow, yes. And wouldn't you know, I want it right down in the corner and it's pushing away from the corner. That's the place I want it and that's the only place it's not going. It's like, why do you have these problems? And I got down in the corner and cleaned it pretty well, I thought. What a pain. I'm gonna have to clean some of the solder out of there because it's uh, built up too much. I don't want that much of a build up. It looks like it's working now. But truthfully, right in the very corner where I wanted it, it didn't seem to solder. <laughs> ah, it, just, it just doesn't quit. Ah, I don't know, bummer. That ought to at least reinforce the corner where it won't open up anymore and bend and break anymore. But it, it didn't do quite what I wanted. Still a little hot. I'm going to see if I can round off the really sharpness there. At least it won't cut you now. It was it was seriously sharp before. And I do think that that will reinforce it down there so that it won't keep bending and break it worse. So I think we're in pretty good shape there. For the shape we're in, we're in good shape. Well, just for the record, I've put the uh, felt inside this so that when we slide this on here, then it should help deaden the strings a little bit there. Well, my friends, I believe we've done all we can do to this no-name mandolin. I don't know if Melissa will be able to find the name of this mandolin or not, and maybe put it on the screen. Maybe she'll do some searches and see if she can find one that looks just like it. But to be honest, I, I like I said, I would guess Regal or Washburn or something like that. But 
it could almost be anybody really. It's uh, a good little solid little mandolin now and so we'll just play it for you so you can hear what it sounds like. tune but I think it was something like never on a Sunday something like that but it just seemed to go on a mandolin of this style so hope you enjoyed that another tune that I almost never pick that may be the second time in my life <laughs> hope you enjoyed it thanks for watching tell your friends <laughs>